Yes, I'm happy to be with you uh, this morning to discuss um, the Genocide Watch that um, Genocide Watch has issued for Kashmir in um, Indian administered Kashmir. Um, our organization, Genocide Watch, has existed since 1999 when I founded it along with the Alliance Against Genocide, which is an alliance of 75 uh, organizations around the world uh, dedicated to preventing genocide. So Genocide Watch uh, was founded to encourage the creation of anti-genocide groups. Um, I realized we needed that organization after I served in the State Department and saw the failure of nation states and the UN to prevent genocide, which is a failure that continues today. Despite all the early warnings, um, there are only a few cases of successful prevention of genocide. Uh, one was in Kosovo, I think, where finally uh, it was called genocide by the war crimes ambassador to the United States, and that then resulted in a uh, uh, attempt by the NATO powers to stop the Serbian genocide of the Muslim Kosovar Albanians. Uh, and it succeeded. So that's one success. Another case was in East Timor where uh, through largely through diplomacy, but also through the influence of really close military connections with between the United States and Indonesia and between uh, Australia and ASEAN countries, there was able to be an intervention that stopped another genocide in East Timor. Unfortunately, uh, those exceptions, most of the efforts to stop genocide or to prevent it have failed. And I think the right main reason is that uh, the nation state continues to be the main way in which uh, the world is organized. And nation states largely get away with whatever they want to do within their own borders. Uh, we can see it, for instance, in Sudan, where You've got four genocides going on simultaneously. And even though Bashir has now been overthrown, he's been replaced by people who were just as guilty of the genocide in Darfur and in, in South Kordofan and other areas of Sudan as he was. So um, there hasn't been a success there yet. So what we do is we try to look for specific signs, early warning signs of genocide. Uh, where the conditions are possible to have genocide. And what we have noticed in Kashmir, particularly uh, very recently when uh, India revoked the uh, autonomous status of Kashmir, uh, is that the, all the conditions are there. So what has happened now is that uh, Article 370 of the Constitution of India has been revoked uh, through presidential uh, order and then by act of uh, the uh, Parliament of India, both houses of Parliament. And that has also meant that Article 35A, which was the provision that allowed Kashmir to prevent other uh, people from outside of Kashmir to, buy, to keep them out of buying property, that has also been revoked. So all of a sudden, uh, people from anywhere can, in India at least, can buy property there. It's a way of restoring Hindu presence in Kashmir. What's happened though, in addition to that, is a real militarization of Kashmir. Throughout this period, India increased its troop numbers in Kashmir every year, and now there are well over 600,000 Indian troops in Kashmir. They have locked down Kashmir. Uh, it is an area now where um, they suspended the internet, uh, which is a very radical step to take if you're a democracy. I mean, it keeps anyone from really having uh, free speech. Uh, you can't communicate. Uh, they even for a long time stopped all of the uh, telephone communications and, and basic communications between Kashmir and the rest of the world. Now, a genocide watch has determined that that is a very dangerous sign that 
uh, some very bad things might happen very soon there. Wherever you have genocide, one of the first things that the government that's planning it does is it shuts off communications to the area where it's planning to commit its atrocities. So we're very worried about that. The other things, of course, uh, that have happened is there's been a curfew imposed so that people can't circulate freely. And there are checkpoints all over uh, Srinagar, for instance, and other parts of Kashmir. This is a police state now. And um, it's a very dangerous situation because you have 95 or more percent of the population that is Muslim. The uh, army, the Indian army in Kashmir is largely Hindu or Sikh and Sikh. And so it's not Muslim for the most part. You have that us versus them uh, sort of dynamic that is also characteristic of genocides. And the result, of course, has been um, a pattern of uh, torture, of uh, uh, disappearances, at least 8,000, according to human rights groups, disappearances. There have been, uh, there's a law that allows people to be detained for up to two years without any charges. I mean, that is, doesn't sound like democracy. Uh, that sounds like a dictatorship. And so what we have in Kashmir are all the conditions that could result in real genocide in Kashmir. Now, our organization is not saying at this point that genocide is going on in Kashmir. Although if you look at it in the long term, uh, there have been estimates that between uh, 1989 and today up to 70,000 people have died. And, you know, you've got to wonder, that's a lot of people who have died. So uh, should that be called genocide? I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that we're very worried that you could have massacres now, serious massacres, particularly because the militant Muslim groups in Kashmir who have been campaigning for uh, a different status for Kashmir could resort to violence. And if they resort to violence, then what you'll have is a um, an excuse, India, to use violence against them. And when you have a overwhelming power like the Indian army using violence, then it can begin to use the violence indiscriminately. And it can and the violence can become genocide. And that's what we're particularly worried about right now.